Let's stay together. Let's say, Father, Father we, receive we receive revelation together revelation. in this session. Your son, your son Jesus is magnified, is magnified. as your word is taught. Yes. You are glorified in his name. And the church receives edification and we are all blessed as we behold him as he sees us in him. Amen! Amen. Glory to God. Oh, let's hear this. Now, John 14. Yesterday we um, began to look at the father. You know, last year we'll look at the father and his family. We're going to look at something else uh, this year. We started looking at that yesterday. Uh, now, John 14, but quickly go to John 17. I didn't quote that last night, but I'll just quickly run through it. John 17. <clears throat> I said yesterday that the ascension is a fact of the resurrection, but we must make a distinction. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead, the four Gospels captured his resurrection. In other words, he, in John, <clears throat> um, Luke 24, uh, verse 25 to 27, also verse 44, no, verse 36, down to verse 45, 46, he, he showed himself to his disciples. And they touched his body. The eyewitness, they touched his body. They ate with him. That became a proof that he rose bodily. Okay? He rose bodily. But then, there was a truth in that resurrection that was not found in the four Gospels. And that is his ascension. You can see his bodily resurrection. But when it comes to his ascension... It can only be known by revelation. That is, you know that by revelation. So, whilst the apostles, the 12 of them, Matthias inclusive, while they were present amongst others, who saw Jesus physically rise from the dead, and they have proof of his humanity afterwards, they had to grow in the knowledge of what happened. Because what is it to study that somebody rose from the dead? There's nothing to study in that. You saw him. If that was the fact needed, their epistles would have been full of stories. He now can eat ikokore. You know what that is? That's the best meal. If that was what Adam ate, there would have been no sin. Wow. <laughs> now make sure you don't quote me. Come on. <laughs> you know, that now he can eat this one. Now he can, you know. That would have been the things they would write in their epistles. But they hardly spoke about that. The truth in the epistles are the truth of the ascension. Where did he go? Where did he go to? Those are the facts that were explained in the epistles. Are you still there? So, <clears throat> in John 14, before we get to John 17, I'm, I know I asked you to go to John 17, but let's go to John 14 first. In John 14, he said in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, verse 2, are many mansions. The word house, there's the word oikea, used for a household in this context. If it were so, if it were not so, I would have told you. Because if, he, if you know, oikea is used for either a dwelling place where people live or a household. Now, I've told you before that words don't have meaning outside their sentences. A dictionary doesn't give you a meaning. It gives you probable meanings. It's a sentence that determines a meaning. I take that again. It's a sentence. For example, I've said this before. We have a board meeting, and I am the secretary of the board, and the chairman is seated there. And I say, Chairman, sir, that is your cup of tea. And I show him the cup of tea. 
for him to drink. Or he now says to me, how do I get to the airport? I have a flight to catch. And I said, that is your cup of tea. I believe I'll visit the HR. Not only security will just take care of that. But, you know, I use the same words, but they have different meanings. Based on what? The sentences before it and after it. And some guys think that Bible study is just knowing Greek words. No, 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 no. That's, so, that's elementary. The sentences tell you the meaning. So by saying in my father's house, it could have been my father's dwelling place. Or my father's household. Now, by using many places, it obviously is talking about a community. Many mansions, Mone, a place. He says there are many. Then he tells us what he is about to do in his resurrection. He says, <clears throat> I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. I told you the word there means to create space, an internal work. Hey, to Mazo, hey, to Matizo in the Greek. It means to create a place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, and the way I am there may be also. Now, a lot of people have taught this to be the rapture, what we call the rapture, the rapture of the church, where the church would disappear, something like that. And we, we thought that he would go to prepare a place for us. And I told you, the moment you misinterpret a statement, a text of scripture, a truth is lost. He said, I'll come again. Of course, it's coming again obviously, is a fact of his resurrection. And receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. So in his resurrection, he rose bodily. In his ascension, we are identified with him. We are identified with him in that ascension. That ascension is this. Watch, watch this. He goes to the right hand of the Father, which we call the kingdom. Now, it's only folks that don't understand who God is that think a kingdom is God owning buildings and lands. God's prized possession is man. If his kingdom is outside the heart of man, he's not any different from the rulers of this world. He's not any different. He's not different from Nero. He's not different from Napoleon or Hitler. He's not different from all the people who conquered territories. His kingdom, his authority, he's meant for man. So when we say the kingdom of God, it's God's work in man. If Jesus went elsewhere by his spirit, if he went elsewhere but to man, then there's still a lot of work, a work that has to be done. Man is God's prized possession. That's why Jesus came. And so the ascension is that in dwelling, I, I, I'll probably dwell on that a bit more later. It, the, the ascension is that in dwelling. It's not in the clouds. The ascension is not in the clouds. The ascension is encased in the flesh. It's not in the clouds. And that is why, pay attention, when Paul explained it, he said he raised us up together. He quickened us. He made us to sit together in Christ. That's why the epistles have in Christ or Christ in. That's the ascension. Let me see how you follow what I'm saying this morning. That's the ascension. In Christ or Christ in. That's the work. And so hear this. The ascension is not visibly seen. 
The ascension is spiritually discerned. John 14, 20. In that day you will know I am in my Father. I am in you. And you are in me. That's the ascension. That's where he went to. And that's a vital fact of the family. The ascension. In John 17, in what we can call the Erotaho, uh, a conversation of prayer. Uh, Erotaho is a conversation of prayer. That is, you restate a uh, frequent or a prior conversation. You are not asking for something new. You are making a discussion. And some people call it the high priest prayer of Jesus. You know, I, 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 I don't know about that, but it, it is a conversation when he says, glorify me with the glory I had with you. It's not like he's begging. He's restating. It's just like Jesus said to us about the, what you call the Lord's Prayer. I tell people, well, if you call it the Lord's Prayer, let the Lord pray it. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, many of the translators, in their own ingenuity, got it wrong in the way they put that particular prayer. Because they said, this, after this man, I pray ye. And so they say, um, give us this day. Meanwhile, let me say this. I, I, get, I guess I can say this here. Uh, what we call translation, I've been saying this to many of us for a while, what we call translations are actually interpretations. Because that's what they are. For example, the King James and many other translations are really interpretations. You know why? Because by putting numbers in those sentences, the numbering of the Bible itself is an interpretation. Because the writers did not number it. So, the, the, the translator believed that this is a meaning in itself. And sometimes they are wrong. So, it's a, an interpretation. Hallelujah. I remember I was saying something about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they said to Nebuchadnezzar, and they said that we're not careful to answer on this matter, and, and they said, uh, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us, and he will yet deliver us, and if not, we will not bow to thee, worship thee, O king. And many translators, which I call interpreters, said it like this, if he does not deliver us, that is their interpretation. The translation is to leave it the way it is. Then grouping it in sentences is interpretation. And I found out that many of them are wrong. Because they could never, in language, double emphasis is the truth. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us and he will deliver us. That's the truth. If not, cannot be what I have affirmed. If not, if you do not cast us into the fire, we will still not worship you. That is proper interpretation. And many translators got it wrong. And I told you, I just exposed that they are not translators. They are interpreters. So you need to get it right. Words in themselves have no meaning till they are placed in sentences. The sentences tell you the meaning. That's why I told you, study the Bible in paragraphs, not in verses. The beginning of a statement, the beginning of a concept, the beginning of a discussion, then where did it end? That will tell you the meaning. For all I've seen and comfort of the glory of God, you are asked people in buses with that. Meanwhile, Though all he referred to, he had mentioned it in verse 19 and 20. Though all that the law made guilty before God. 
He didn't say everybody born into this world has sinned. How would you sin when you were not born? Sinned is a verb. You did it without doing it. That's not true. He's just restating verse 19. But the translator separated it, and you might get that wrong. But when you read chapter 3, down to verse 22, 23, 24, then verse 23 will make sense to you. A statement is only true amongst the statements around it. The moment you give it a life of its own, you are writing a new statement. Don't give it a life of its own. Jesus said, come unto me all ye that labor, and I heavy laden. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. I will give you rest. Hebrews 4. We that have believed do enter into rest. Two different statements. Two different things. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16. Agape. First John 2. Love not the world. How will God love the world and tell me not to love the world? Same words, but the sentences tell you the difference. Who's following what I'm saying here? And scripture says friendship with the world is enmity with God. Go into all the world. <laughs> so you've got to know what he's talking about in the context of what he's saying. Hallelujah. Who's following what we're saying here this morning? All right, so in John 17, <clears throat> so I was saying that the, the, the Lord's Prayer, which is popularly called, should be, you give us this day our daily bread. You deliver us from the evil one. You forgive us our trespasses. Not as we. No. You forgive us our trespasses, so we forgive those who trespass against us. Because they had the option of that omnibus word, which can be used as as comparison, emphasis, so, that. So in their interpretation, they chose uh, so we. No, uh, as we, sorry. Meanwhile, they were wrong. Because the father is the example, not the follower. And then they said later on, they said, if you forgive not those who trespass against you, your heavenly father will not forgive. What is the meaning of that? That means the heavenly father will commit sin. Again, the translators, somebody asked me a couple of days back, when are you coming up with your own translation? I'm not doing translation. When we do it, you will see it. We have done book. You have not read it finished. <laughs> you are asking, and somebody actually said, why are all your books just, just theological, 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 theological? Why not inspirational? Are the books disturbing you? <laughs> Too bad. Hang in there. We have more to come. <laughs> and we're not tired. Age is on our side. We can do four per month. You guys are scared, right? <laughs> you say, Pastor, that's a prophecy for the future, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, you know, by saying that you forgive, so the Father will forgive, is wrong. Because earlier on in chapter 5, in verse 44 and 45, he says, love them. So love your enemies. Pray for them, bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you will be like your heavenly Father. Who makes his sun to shine on everybody, just unjust. He makes his rent to fall on the wicked and the good guys. He said, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. 
Now, because they put those things in chapters, you didn't know it was a continuous conversation. If you had understood chapter 5 very well, by the time you got to chapter 6, and then they said, forgive so that your father will forgive you, you know it's a contradiction. It is forgive because your heavenly father forgives. Who's following what we're saying this morning? So I say, what gods do you have to change the word of God? No, I change the words of men. <laughs> Not the word of God. Hallelujah. How did I get here? John 17. All right. So the prayer in John 17 is obviously what you can call an error towel. A conversation of what has already been discussed. Or a statement or restatement of what you had already said. Because everything Jesus said in John 17 was a prophecy or prophecies of the old covenant. And then he says, and I'm particular about verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Verse 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me. I have given them, watch this, that they may be one as we are one. Years ago, we used these verses for unity of churches. And then you see in the same meeting, those who tie their heads with scarf. No wrong in that, it's fashion. And those who open theirs. For fresh hair. And those who don't wear shoes. Because they saw an angel. And those who, whose shoes disturb the service. And those who are made up. And those who are still in Eden. I'll leave that out. So they all come together and they hold themselves. One does not speak in tongues and doesn't believe in it. One speaks in tongues to fight enemies. The other one is when the spirit moves him. And then this one, he doesn't think all of them are really genuinely sanctified. <laughs> so they hold their hands that we may be one. That's a Nollywood script. <laughs> That's not what that verse is for. That verse is the result of believing the gospel. He said, those that believe through their word, as you believe the gospel, that's what he said before, that they may be one. Everything Jesus said, I pray, is not like I'm begging you to do. This is Jesus carrying out the desire of the Father in his death and resurrection. So by his resurrection, he says that they may be one. I'm going to do this. That you will sanctify them. I'm going to do this. So that they may be one. And that's the glory. So the glory of Christ. Is in men. The glory of Christ. That those men have been found now with God. With the father. And so we want to study. What does the father give? I was saying it yesterday, and some of you just laughed because I watched the clip again. And I said, so go, uh, uh, I call you father, because you're my father. You are the father to me. I call you. And after saying all of that, because some of us just like good readings. Good readings. After saying all of that, then you start some nicknames. He said, Oh Lord, what do go on? Now I know you can start going on Facebook against me. I really don't care. I've lost all that years ago. But that's not his name. That's not his name. Jesus did not introduce us to Allah Wag Boboro. <laughs> he introduced to us the Father. That's what he did. Now I know that those who sing it and say it are not bad people. They're not, they're Christians. But they just need to update their knowledge. 
You can be famous and you are ignorant. Something can be famous and it's not the truth. So it's working for me. Because you employed it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, look at something. To what? The last words. Look at the last words Jesus said. I want you to pay attention to details. In John 14, look at how many times Jesus referred to God. John 14, verse 2. He called him Father in my Father's house. John 14, 7. You should have known my Father. John 14, 9. He that has seen me has seen the Father. How did I ask? Show us the Father. Look at, you see, when you see words repeated that way, pay attention. Look at verse 10. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. The words I speak, I speak unto you. I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the work. In how many sentences? In the last words of Jesus, hear this well, between John 14 to John 17 up to John 20, he used the term father more than all the three and a half years he spent. You know why? Because we have gotten to the real issues now. He used the term father so consistently that if you missed it, you will miss anything. That's what he did. He used the term. Again, in verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. For what else? Believe me for the very work's sake. Verse 12, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works I do shall he do also, and greater than this because I go to my Father. Look at it again in verse 13. Whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 16, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another covenant that he may abide with you forever. And the conversation goes on and on. In verse 20, at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Verse 21, he says, look, he, he, he that loved me, he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I love him, and will manifest myself to him. In verse 20, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our board with him. In verse 24, the word which you hear is not mine, but the father which sent me. In verse 26, the comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the father will send in my name. In verse 28, I said unto you, I go when I come unto you. If you love me, you will rejoice, because I said I go to my father, for my father is good than I. In verse 31, but the world may know that I love the Father. As the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. He said, arise, let us go hence. How would you miss this? What was Jesus talking about? The Father. He's talking about redemption. He's talking about sacrifice. And he doesn't even mention sin yet. The emphasis was on the Father. He doesn't mention sin. He doesn't mention it. He's focused on the Father. In chapter 15, verse 1, like I told you, these are chapterized by the writers, um, by the translators. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband man. The emphasis, he's so strong. My father is the one working. In verse 8, here is my father glorified. In verse 9, as the father has loved me, even so I love you. Continue you in my love. Are you there? Are you still there? Look at verse 26. Or verse 23. He that hates me, hates my father also. Verse 24. And hated both me and my father. Verse 26. And when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from my father, even the spirit of truth who possess from my father, he shall testify of me. In verse 3, chapter 16, all things, these things will I do unto you because you have not known the Father, nor me. Would they do, sorry? Because they've not known the Father, nor me. He's so consistent 
In verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Verse 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. Verse 16, a little while and you shall not see me. And again a little while and you shall see me because I go to the Father. You will see me because I go to the Father. How would you see me if I'm gone? If going to the Father is an absence, why would you see me? You will see me because I go to the Father. That is, you will see me because I'm coming to live in you. A consistent emphasis. And don't forget, John was the only one who recorded this sermon. He was the only one. The last words of Jesus, which are tied irreversibly to the work of redemption. When he got to verse 27. Not 27 yet. Come on. Verse 23. In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily I say unto you. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name. He will give it to you. In verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh. When I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. I shall show you plainly. Of the Father. Are you there? Of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name. And I will say unto you. I will not say unto you. That I will pray the Father for you. Wow. He now says. For the Father himself loves you. And because you have loved me. And I believe that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father. And come into the world. Again I leave the world. And go to the Father. And then the disciples said, Lo, now speak thou plainly, and speak no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needs not that any man shall ask thee, but this we believe, that thou came forth from God. Then Jesus said, Do you now believe? So this was a faith message. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave him alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that you and me shall have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but the, be, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. When he said this, they lifted up his eyes and said, Father, the hour has come. Hallelujah. You cannot miss this. How would you miss this? How? How would this be lost in what you believe? How? You can miss this. In John 20 and verse 17. This was when he rose from the dead. And Mary Magdalene saw him. And Jesus, and she said, I mean, Jesus said unto her, verse 16, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus now said unto her, Touch me not. I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, unto my God and your God. Hallelujah. What was the emphasis of Jesus? What was the emphasis? The Father. The emphasis of Christ in the last minutes, the last moments, was the Father. Very strong. Now, interestingly, in the book of Acts, 28 chapters, the book of Acts, Aside two references, God isn't called Father. And I can readily tell you that those two references dealt with Jesus. Acts 1-4. Acts 1-4. Acts 1-4. Still out there? Are you still out there? 
being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not be departed from heaven, from Jerusalem, sorry. But wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me. That's Jesus said that, the promise of the Father. In Acts 2.33, Peter describing the event. Now says, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed for this which you now see and hear. Now, I've, I've told you that the word having received there is not Jesus that received. It's the 120 that received. Very good. So, besides that, why was this so? Why? Why, why was it so? 28 chapters and, and, and no, no reference. To the Father. All the sermons of the apostles, the one by Peter, the one by uh, uh, Philip, and the one by Paul. Paul, yeah, Paul. Didn't have a reference to the Father. And that is why you will not find believers also called sons of God. Two. Not one place did you find anyone called a child of God or folks called the children of God? You will also not see any reference of the Spirit in anybody. It's always on. I'll take it again. The term Father for God was never used in the sermons. That's the first thing. The second and vital truth. Nobody, of course because of that, nobody was called a son of God. Because to call people sons of God, you have to have father in your sermons. And then, though they spoke a lot about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, they never spoke about the Spirit in anyone. Not one reference. The book of Acts. Why was this so? The book of Acts is a book of an eyewitness. It cannot be writing revelation. He has to write what his eyes can see. Are you still there? Come on. Look at this. Look at the book of Luke. Because we know Luke wrote the book of Acts. In Luke chapter 1, he, he, he tells us exactly the kind of accounts that this represent. Luke's gospel chapter 1. Are you still there? Come on guys, are you still there? Luke chapter 1, look at it. Verse 1. For as much... As many have taken in hand, we're going to do some study this morning, so you go get ready. Well, I mean, we're going to study today, tomorrow, the morning and afternoon sessions. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order the declaration of those things which are most assuredly believed amongst us. Now, the, he, he, he was careful. The word things there, you know, when we say things today, those things, many times we refer to inanimate objects or refer to material substances. Sometimes we refer even to words that people say. Now, when you say things here, the word there is pragma, P-R-A-G-M-A, -A, which refers to a deed. A deed. D-E-D, D-E-D, -D, an action or an event. Jesus, for example, used the word thin in Matthew 18, 19. And he was talking about forgiveness. In Acts 5, 4, you'll find Peter said it to Ananias about the thing that he had done, an action. Matters. In Hebrews 6, 18, by two immutable things, which is impossible for God to lie, the things there refer to something God did. Things. Hebrews 10.1. Summary of the whole thing. Theme. Now, but then, Hebrews 11.1. 1, Faith is the substance of things of born. 
It's not substance of a car you don't have or substance of a visa you've been applying for. The word thing there is an action. Faith is the substance of an action hoped for, the action of Christ. Because that's referring to the Old Testament saying, whose faith was hope. They hoped that Christ would be raised from the dead. So their faith was a substance of what they expected. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You see many versions, versions, I've already called them interpretations. We say, faith is the assurance. Some people say, title deed. Now, wow. And then some people have built their entire teaching on title deed. Whereas the, ter- the text is a past tense event of the Old Testament b- brother who by faith, believed the gospel as a promise of what God will do in Christ. So his faith, what he believed, is as good as it had happened. He isn't using that for material things. So the same way, and also James 3.16, you know, leave that for time. So in the same way, Luke's gospel chapter 1 verse 1 of the things, that is, what has been done, which are most assuredly believed amongst us. In other words, Luke is saying, I'm, all right, I'm writing about things that have happened, events that we have believed. He calls it, a, watch this now, he calls it a declaration, or a better version would say a narration. A narration. The word dehiges is in the Greek, D-I-E-G-S-I-S, a, a, a narration. Then he tells us in verse 2, which is critical, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. That is, eyewitnesses means they saw it with their own eyes. Autoptes in the Greek, O-U-T, so A-U-T-O-P-T-E-S. Auto means your own. Then up to nine. What you saw with your physical eyes. What you saw by yourself. What you could look at. What you could write. What you could take down. And who did he call these ministers of the word? Pay attention. So these witnesses were ministers of the word. Not just folks on the street. These witnesses were the apostles of Christ because they were the witnesses from the beginning. Acts 1. He uses the same phrase in Acts 1. Verse 21. Wherefore of this man, which have company with us all the time, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day which he was taken from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So these are ministers. And then in, in Luke's Gospel 1 2, Luke, Luke used a different term when he used the word minister. It is the word used for an officer. An official work. Not the normal Darkonian. An official work. Like a soldier. Luke 4.20. An officer. Acts 26 verse 16. An official work. That is, they were designated. That is, Luke is saying that I got my account from the twelve. I got my account from the twelve. Now listen carefully. So the twelve didn't give him doctrine. The twelve gave him a story. They gave him a doctrine. No, they gave him a story. And then Luke's gospel again, he mentions the fact that he calls them ministers of the word. In other words, ministers of the message. Now whenever you say the word message there, you are referring to the message of the scriptures. 
So, Luke's job was not to write Revelation. His job was to write a narration. Narration of events. That's what he did. So, why was this so? Why did he have to do this? You see the relevance in a moment. Why did he have to do this? Look at Second Peter. At least if he told us he got it from the twelve. The twelve can give us clarity of thought. They can tell us a bit more facts and details that we might not have. Second Peter chapter 1. Watch this, sir. Here's Peter. He says in verse 16, I want you to listen carefully here. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. The word cunningly devised there is where you have the word sophizo. That is to wisely, intelligently craft something. So we have not just put down an intelligent story for you. No. It says, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you now. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says here, is it in the future or in the past? Come on, talk to me. In the past. Very good. In the past. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word he used here, coming, is the word presence. Parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-S. Is used many times for an immediate presence. Someone coming around. Someone being there. In 1 Corinthians 16, 17, Paul used it for his presence. He's been available, been around. 2 Corinthians 7, 7. 2 Corinthians 10, 10. Philippians 1, 26. Just put that for another study. Philippians 2, 12. It can be used for what has happened. The coming. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said we were eyewitnesses. So. This is exactly what Luke was saying. So we, we've not sat down. To devise something. We didn't go to study it. You know because. If we are studying it. Making research. Then we are no longer eyewitnesses. We are now sophizo. He said no. That is, this has nothing to do with revelation. He had nothing to do with study. He had nothing to do with research. He had nothing to do with the scriptures. This was just what we saw. We didn't have to. We didn't have to. You know, when you see something, when something is the truth that you saw, you don't have to think through it. Just, oh, I saw him there. He was there that day. He took this. And, and that's just simple. So he says, look, we are eyewitness of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice unto him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, Peter here is referring to Matthew's account. Matthew 17, 5. Obviously, Matthew was not there. Matthew must have gotten his account from Peter. Who's following what we're saying here? So, Luke wasn't there. Mark wasn't there. But John was there. And John didn't write about it. John just said, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. That's how John summarized. The word became flesh. He summarized the angel speaking. Whether it's three wise men or 300. He just said, the word. He just took the scriptures as fulfilled in the incarnation and called it the message. That's what John did. But Peter here gave us that account. In the Mount of Transfiguration. And don't forget, this was the beat he caught when he woke up. <laughs> you have to know that because we can't rely on his account because he slept throughout camp meeting. <laughs> he woke up the last session. That's why the only thing he caught was barely a sentence. 
You must have slept for two, three hours. She just woke up. And what the world says I am. <laughs> and that was it. So, that's why even upon that, he still didn't know who Jesus was. Because he was sleeping. But, thank God he woke up at a point. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. When we were with him in the holy mount. You know, these are verses Paul cannot quote. You can't say, say after me, we were with him. Who are you and who? <laughs> this is strictly eyewitness account. Now, when he said that, obviously, he's telling you the summary of the four gospels who were with him. We heard him. We saw him. We were with him. In the Holy Mount. Then he says, in verse 19. Now, the King James doesn't do us well in verse 19 by saying, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Meanwhile, pay attention here. The word more today, when I say more, I'm talking about an advancement. When I say more money, that's better, right? More work. But more money, that means plus this. But the word here is an adjective. The word here is not a comparison. It actually is an adjective. It can't be a comparison because, because just a single word. Now, in the same, in the same, in the same book, in verse ten, it says, "Give diligence to make your calling and election sure." So, Peter is not saying we have something better. No, he using comparison. Listen carefully. He's giving you a story that we saw Jesus in his earthly walk. We heard the Father confirm him. And then you're still listening to him. He wants to convince you. Say, so we saw him. We saw him. We saw him. Yeah, we did. We heard the voice. Then he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Why did he say that? He's saying to you that what we heard and saw is prophecy fulfilled. Not a comparison. That is, our eyewitnesses are fulfillment or is a fulfillment of a prophecy. So he uses the word bebaios in the Greek. And that says a more sure word of prophecy. The word word of prophecy is just one single word. It's the word propheticon. P-R-O-P-H-E-T-I-K-O-N. P-R-O-P-H-E-T-I-K-O-N. It means words or utterances. Romans 16, 12, 26, sorry. Paul uses the same thing. The prophetic word. What does that mean? He's saying to us, that we are eyewitnesses of the fulfillment of prophecy. He's not comparing things. That is, the eyewitness is in fulfillment of prophecy. It is not the explanation of it. It's in fulfillment. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Or, and you see, the why, why King James used the word more sure is that, look, this is confirmed. That is, Peter is saying, what we saw is confirmed by the words of the prophet. Let me see your hand if you're following what I'm saying here now. What we saw, what we heard, is confirmed by the words of the prophet. Where unto? Pay attention now. You take heed 
as unto a light. Now, when it says, take heed as unto a light. Now, hold on now, if you're a Bible student, when it says the more sure word of prophecy or utterances of the prophets is referring to the Old Testament. That what we saw is the fulfillment of prophecies given before now. Is that very clear? It says, you will now take heed. You will do well. To take heed. That is, to look at it closely. Now, take it to what? Take it to the utterance of the prophets. As unto a light. Now, when you say as unto, that's a figure of speech. As unto a light. The word light, there's the word luchnos. L-U-C-H-N-O-S. It refers to a lamp. It is not the light itself. It only carries the light. So he says, these utterances are not the light. They carry the light. They are what you call the lamp. Today we call them candles or something like that. There is a lamp. The same word used for John the Baptist. John 5.35. Jesus said, is a burning and a shining light. He was not the light. John 1, the true light that lights every man that enters into the world. John 1, verse 9, he was not the light, but he was a lamp. So all the prophets of the old covenant, they were lamps. They were not light. They were lamps. They carried an information, but they were not the information themselves. Are you following what we're saying here? So he says, and the light that shineth. Don't say, I am shining. Say, the path of the just shines as a light of the perfect day. How can that be your confession? That is the just man in the old covenant. We are in the perfect day now. Always understand the, that progression. Is from the old covenant, Proverbs 4 18, from the old covenant till now. And Peter is saying the same thing here. I told you yesterday, we have a way of making futuristic what is present. And making present what is past. Uh, yeah. We just change everything as our feelings dictate. He says, You take heed as unto a lamp. That shineth in a dark place. Wow. <laughs> the word shineth there is the word finals, P H A I N O S. It means to become visible. That means as they kept speaking, what they were saying became clearer over time. Over time. Over time. Over time. The same thing, Hebrews 1 1. God was sundry times in diverse manners spoken time past to our fathers by the prophets. Sundry times, diverse manners. Amplified, puts it well. He calls it partial revelation. So they were speaking gradually. Becoming visible. As so in the, a dark place. The word dark is the word archmeros. A-U-C-H-M-E-R-O-S. It means obscurity. What does that mean? That means the words of Christ in the old covenant is I've missed many other words. Not everything in the old covenant, not everything they said was about Christ. Say unto Ahab, that's not about Christ. If I be a man of God, that's not, that's not about Christ. Kill every, every child, kill every animal, that's not about Christ. Had missed all they were saying, will now find a light becoming visible. Becoming visible. Becoming visible. Says you will now have to take heed. Many of us in our study of the old covenant, we don't take heed to that light. We read everything together, both the dark place and the light. It says you will take heed. You will look closely because he just said it that the father confirmed Christ. Said, This is my beloved son. That light became visible gradually in the old covenant. You will now take heed to it. 
It has missed many things. I am the Lord that make it alive. Ochmeros. A dark place. Obscure. So he's telling you, you will find seeming contradictions in the Old Testament. You will see it. You will see it. Who's following what I'm saying this morning? You see it. Job. Job said, the Lord give it. The Lord take it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And somebody wrote that down for us. If I were to write, or John, the beloved, was to write that place, he would just say, Job said many terrible things. <laughs> he would not give us the details. But they gave us about 40 chapters of rubbish. So Peter says, take heed. Are you there? Take heed. See how many prophets were speaking. And God had just one witness, his son. One. You will take heed. As that, they are light bearers. Finals becoming visible. Visible as unto a light that shines in a dark place. Are you there? In a dark place. Until. Woo! Go away to God. Until. Until the day dawn. No, 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 no. Why would you say day dawn? Why did he put it together? The word day is the word emeras. Today, a period. The day should have dawned. You should separate the day and the dawn. The day done. When you say dawn, it means the lights breaking out of the shadows. The day dawn. When it was midnight, some light, some darkness. God is good, and then it's fearsome. We saw all that. Then it says, until the day dawned. It came. The word Daugazo is the word dawn. D-I-A-U-G-A-Z-O. It means to come out of shadows, to become transparent. A gradual progression. The day dawn and the day star. Wow. <laughs> the day star, it says, arise in your hearts. Day star is the word phosphorus. The day star are the epistles. The day star. The lights. Full light. They arise in your heart. That is, the epistles are the revelation of Christ. But in the Old Testament, you will find a light that shines in a dark place. A dark place. Obscurities. Obscurities. In different times and seasons. Then he says, they arise in your heart. Then in verse 20, knowing this first, the word proton, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. The word interpretation there means to be determined by a man. An explanation, a source of reasoning that came from a man. What's he saying? What we wrote about Christ's humanity had been spoken of before. You probably won't see it because it was spoken amongst many things. You won't see it. In other words, the humanity of Christ was a message. It was a message. And people had to document it for us. It was a message. Nothing has put people in a state of almost conundrum 
than seeing Christ. And then he makes the claims that he is God. He makes the claims that he came from God. He makes the claims as deity. And what baffled people's minds was he at more times than ever, than others, sorry, he disclaimed everything they had taught about God. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Well, if you come to Nigeria, you probably hurt some. At least mosquitoes. But the point is, this was a fellow that refused to call down fire. Imagine if Jesus called down fire once. Pilate wouldn't near him. He wouldn't near him. When you hear, eh, he healed the sick. You abuse him, he just looked at this. And all the winds from all the continents came after you alone. They won't hit you here, they just stay in the sky. Can you see what I'm saying? Last warning. He wasn't like that. And then Peter says, go to the words of the prophet. You will see a consistent light in the midst of the darkness. A consistent light. Something that binds the whole thing together. That light had no contradiction. The contradiction was the dark place. It wasn't. So, so you would do well to take heed. So we did not devise a fable when we told you he came. No, 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 no. Our eyewitnesses was to witness the fulfillment of the scriptures. And God is good. Why? Because Christ is good. God is good. So he's saying that what we saw had been guaranteed. You know, everything we hear about Christ's humanity is eyewitness. He's eyewitness. They wrote it to us. They told us. They told us he healed the sick. They told us that he wasn't killing anybody. They told us that he didn't cause anybody to be sick. They told us that when the prostitute came at him, the prostitute fell at his feet and he says, your sins are forgiven. What? As he was doing that in Luke's Gospel 7, all the Pharisees and Sadducees, the chief priests were not there. He said, ah, if this man, see what they say, if this man were to be a prophet of God, See, their prophet's ministry, he would have known that she was a prostitute. That is, their own prophet is to find sin. He would have known. You know, some people, that's their prophet's ministry. There are eight ladies here. The Lord is speaking to me right now. We know where you were last night. I don't want to call you out. But I'm going to call you out. <laughs> he said, he would have known. You know, some folks like that's their prophet's ministry. When they see a fine lady with long hair. Now, I'm not against those who have short ones. Some of you are looking at me every time. Ah, Pastor, why long hair all the time? Paul says, if a woman have long hair, it's glory. It's written in scriptures. <laughs> written in the epistles. <laughs> he just come. He come. His boss is yellow. Have you had some boyfriends in the past? He says, no. Hmm. What about spiritual ones? <laughs> if this man was a prophet, he would have known. Even the disciples were doing like this. That's also woman, 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 woman. This <laughs> the last time we went to buy food, we came back. It was with the woman at the well. <laughs> There's also woman, 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 woman. And their minds will have gone. Why should she should just get married? <laughs> you know, their minds will have been going astray. 
Then he knew what was in their heart. He said, hey, Peter, if a man has two debtors, one hold him a hundred million dollars, one a hundred nine, you know, they can't be found together. <laughs> there is no hundred nine, one million dollars. It doesn't exist in it. <laughs> so he says, which one who will be grateful the most? Peter, ah, it's one, one million dollars. Huh? He said, very good. When I came to your house, what did you offer me? Your sick mother-in-law. Did you give me water? He said, no. Did you give me any kiss? Don't forget, not to the mouth straight away. <laughs> Did you give me this? He said, no. In other words, he's exposing even Peter's hypocrisy. He said, no, sir, I didn't give you. But you didn't ask. <laughs> he said, this woman, ever since she came, she has not ceased to kiss me, to wipe my feet with tears. He said, he that has loved, he that has been forgiven much, would worship much, he would love much. He's talking to Peter, because Peter is thinking, I'm not a prostitute. <laughs> but that's how hypocrites think, I'm not a prostitute. People say, I'm not, I'm not a prostitute. When you give a taco, are you here? You need, you need Christ in your life. Are you a prostitute? Are you a drinker? Are you a science student? Are you a this? <laughs> you, know, come on, you look at yourself and say, I'm not a science student. I'm not a prostitute. I'm not this one. Jesus said, you have been forgiven little. It's a figure of speech. When you say that to people, when Jesus said that to people, is a figure of speech to expose their hypocrisy. You know, he told the Pharisees, he says, they were like this. So I have to use you guys. He said, I have not come to call the righteous. You know, it's a figure of speech. But the sick. He said, those that are whole, you need no physician. Because I felt true. <laughs> So it's a figure of speech. So what it says, he that is forgiven much is a figure of speech. That means the more you see him, the more you see his character, the more you see his love, the more you see his forgiveness, you will worship more. Any service driven by fear is not true. A service driven by love is true worship. What you hear? On the last day, only two believers, two believers, two believers. You hear that? You join the ushering team. You hear? When the trumpet shall sound, you leave, you just in the ushering team, you join the music team. Oh, when I say, ah, you join security. Go marching in, go marching in. Then you hear? Give me one song, you should know one of those songs. I've forgotten those songs, Pastor Bonde. You should know this song. <laughs> we have been there together. <laughs> well, you hear another song about this coming. He's coming back again, my Lord. He's coming back again. You just go for evangelism. <laughs> when you're not here, your sins and iniquities remember us no more. You say, Me, eh? I'm careful. This, this, this preaching that you are preaching, forgiving, yesterday, today, forever, hmm. that is not driving you to preach. It's not driving you to join the workforce of church. But when you're, he's coming back again. You are, you are shaking like tilapia. You are both afraid of God and the devil. Double wahala for dead body and the owner of dead body. Something's wrong with you. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. He took care of the law. He took care of the sin consciousness that we will serve God acceptably with godly reverence. He destroyed the law and his consciousness. He consumed all those steps, six steps, 20 steps. How about Moses? How far? Inner court, outer court. Inner court still had other courts. Ah! 
Hello, brother. He said, our God is a consuming fire. He consumed all of them. He gave us a new and a living way. Hallelujah. You hear that? He's called me. Paul wrote about the rapture, what we call the rapture today. He said, comfort yourselves with these things. You hear it today? He said, caution yourself. <laughs> 2018, like, caution yourselves. He said, comfort yourself. After writing to the Corinthian church and giving them all sorts of koboko, I'll show you a mystery. Let me show you, let me show you like that, like that. We shall not all sleep. We shall be changed. She will be steadfast, eh? be immovable, always abounding, knowing that your work for the Lord is not in vain. He said that to all of them. But today, is your name in the book of life? <laughs> Oga, oh is your own there? <laughs> Who showed you? Many people have black market book of life. <laughs> Are you still there? Yes, sir. He says there was a day done, a day that dawned, the day star. That is, the light came out of the shadows. Christ came out of presumptions. He came out of that contradiction. If you were confused before, you are no longer confused. If you thought, who did this one? Who did that one? Now he has come himself. That's why he said to them in John 5. Did you hear any voice? Did you see anything? He didn't. He says, the scriptures testify of me. Now, you can see it. You can hear the voice. You can see. So visibly, that thing we heard in the old covenant, you cannot see God. You cannot see God. Whereas what God said to Moses, no man sees me and will not leave. Hallelujah. When you see him, you leave. And then God became someone you can see physically. Somebody that they said was in the temple that you'll be doing turari. What's turari? Incense. Say, so, no, he's no, he, he cannot be told to. You have to be very careful. You are going, you put blood, blood, just going. They put the program in, so in case you die, they will know. And go, come, come. Everybody's what? Hosanna, Hosanna. Abba. The word became flesh. The law says when you're a woman and you have your menstrual cycle, if you see temple that is run like this, a woman with blood flowing for 12 years touched this girl. Twelve years. Not menstrual period, though. Menstrual life. <laughs> touched this girl! And she got power out of it. A prostitute had him say, your sins are forgiven. That's what he said. Peter says, we are not, we did not conly devise these things. When we made known unto you the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are eyewitnesses. We saw things that many of the prophets did not put together properly. We saw a man calm the storms and not bring them on people. We saw him heal the sick and not put sickness on people. We saw him forgive the worst of sinners. We saw him provide for people's needs. We saw him. And what we saw was prophecy fulfilled. The more sure word of prophecy. As the day dawn, the day star arises in your heart. You will take heed. Many are not taking heed. God of Elijah sent down fire. Did God ever bring down fire when he came here? Not a single fire came through Jesus. Not one. Not a single fire. God of Elijah sent down fire. God of Elijah sent down fire. God, those ones don't even have day done. They don't even have ultramarous. 
is total aposkisma. <laughs> Have mercy. Come on. Say, God don't answer it by fire. He will be my God. Say, no, 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 don't say he will be my God. That's not good. He is my God. God answer it by fire. He's already my God. No, no, no. That's why consistently refer to God in how Jesus introduced him to us. Come on, somebody was saying this. Say, how can you want to praise God? I know you say it's Father. Father. That's when you both praise. He said, when we get to crazy praise, who said, Abba. Ah, ah. Jesus used father. You, you use Kinu. <laughs> and you say Jesus is your Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. He that has seen me yes. has seen the Father. So what they saw was a fulfillment of scriptures, but not the explanation. They saw the fulfillment, but not the explanation. Are you still out there? Luke 24. You learning something? Every epistle was a correction of the impression men had about God. From James to Hebrews to 1st and 2nd Peter to 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. <laughs> Definitely the Pauline epistle. In Luke 24, watch this now. Yesterday, we talked about experience and revelation. In Luke 24, here's Jesus amongst his own disciples. He has been, he's raised from the dead and he's talking to them. And then they were arguing. Jesus was crucified. You know, they took him away. The movement went to the, to the, to the sepulcher. They cannot find his body and all that. Then he says to them in verse 25, Oh fools and slow of heart, to believe. All that the prophet has spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Not every scripture, but the scriptures about Christ. The things concerning himself. Told you be careful of using the word all. The word all is always within the sentence. Don't say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Come and slap me, let me see. <laughs> That's not what it means. He says, I have been taught, I have learned to abase, to abound. Philippians 4.11 I have learned to go hungry and then to be full. I am independent of every circumstance. I can do all this through Christ that strengthens me. That's what he meant. All things work together for good to them who love God. Romans 8, 28, to them who, who are called according to the purpose, say, well, bread, bread, no matter what you are going through, all these are working. See how you are even working. <laughs> how can all things work together? How can sin work with faith? No! What is all things? He says to, to those he foreknew. To them he predestinated or predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he will be the firstborn among many brethren. The word conformed there is not a gradual progression. It's a once and for all event. Some of all in the Greek, it means to be fashioned after, to be created after. Those that he predestined, he called. Those they called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. What shall we then say to these things? Those are the things that are working together. All the things God is working together. His foreknowledge, his predestination, his call, and his justification, they work together for our good. So, what shall we say then to these things? Which things? His calling, his justification. If God be for us, who? Again, the King James picked who. So people are looking for who all over the place. 
Meanwhile, the Greek word there can be who, what, which. Now, by there was no person in issue. The issue was condemnation. If God be for us, what can be against us? That is the condemnation of the law. Are you still there? He who spared not his son, but gave him up to die for us, shall he not with him freely give us of all these things? What are the things? His calling, his predestination, his justification. Are you still out there? Who is he that condemneth? Who is he that justifies? He asks those questions rhetorically in question because the answers are in there. Who condemns the law? Or what is it that condemns the law? He told you that in Romans already. And who is he that justifies? Christ who died. Hallelujah. Still out there? So Jesus brings his disciples to see that light that shined through the darkness. Hallelujah. They were prophesying people dying because of sin. But they now prophesied of an innocent one who would die not for his sins, but for others. And that was the light that was shining. The light about God was in that sacrifice. Again, when he rose up, and those guys, you know, they went back and told the other folks, they said, well, did our hearts not burn in us? In verse 32, as he opened to us the scriptures, they told the others and all that. Luke 24, then when they got together, in verse 37, they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that, you know, there was, a, there was a brother years back that wanted to prophesy and he says, if you are affrighted, you know, he has King James prophetic language. If you are affrighted <laughs> and supposed that they are seen a spirit, he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do your, heart, your thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. And then he ate with them. Pay attention here. And they heard him. You know, in spite of that, Jesus could have just told them, you know, guys, this is me. Touch me. And then they will just go into all the world and everything they write will just be like the book of Acts. They will just write like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We saw he wore lovely sandals. His hair was so fine. He rose from the dead. That's what they will have said. Because that's, if that was all he did to them, would just appear to them and say, see me now. See, see my back side. See my back. I can see play for us now. What's your problem with that? He can't play for red devils. He said, cast out devils. He said, be not drunk with wine wearing in excess. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you know, he called out the sick from the pool of Siloam, the liver pool. Hallelujah. Are you there? Come on. <laughs> In verse 44, he said, all these things, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. It's not everything there that was about him. So I said, you can find Christ in every verse. Come, come. Let me hug you. How can you find Christ in every verse? There was a lot of arch mirrors. But there was a light that kept appearing. Finals. It kept growing, growing, growing until the incarnation. So, he showed them. When he was done, verse 45, said in, open the ear their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Hear this now. This is vital. 
So their hearts opened. At that point, I'm going to ask you this question. What was he explaining to them? His resurrection. And then their hearts opened. And then they saw it. And then they believed it. That God raised Jesus from the dead for our sins. They saw it. And they believed it. And then they're born again. But notice something. So what they had seen, what they were seeing was a confirmation of a prophecy or prophecies that have been given. That's why verse 46 says, Thus it is written, and thus it behold Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. There's no verse like this in the Old Testament. This is the summary of the prophecies about Christ. Just like the scripture, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's a summary of the Old Testament prophecies about Christ. Having said that, pay attention. You'll notice that when they were preaching in the book of Acts, the content of their message, I want you to listen to this very well. In the book of Acts, go to the book of Acts now. The content of their message had to do with two things. First of all, we read one in Acts 1, 21 to 22, where they were called the eyewitnesses from the baptism of John. In Acts 2, as Peter began to preach what happened on the day of Pentecost, the first thing he did, listen carefully now, was he quoted Joel. Acts 1, verse 16. He quoted Joel to verse 21. Then he got to verse 22 and said, you guys, you saw Jesus Christ. You saw how among you he walked miracles. He says, and then you slew him. In verse 23. In verse 24, he says, now whom God had raised up, having lose the pains of death, because it couldn't be possible that he should be holding of it. Then he began to quote the prophets again. He now quoted David. He went on and on. Listen carefully to this one now. He went on and on and on. Then... In verse 32, this Jesus had God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now, remember that Jesus told them, you shall be witnesses unto me, Acts 1.8. And Luke 24, 48. And I told you before that those scriptures were specific to those who saw him rise from the dead. You shall be witnesses of me. He said that to them. Now, as they were preaching, they combined both what they saw and what had been prophesied. But what they saw was not primary. It was because there was a prophecy. They combined in that. In chapter 3, as well. Chapter 3. Let me just run through that for you. Verse 13, what happened? Verse 18, what the prophet had said. Verse 22 to 26 was about the prophets. Chapter 3. In chapter 4. Verse 19, they said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Verse 20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. But yet, in verse 23, verse 24, pardon me, to verse 29, they quoted the prophets. In chapter 5, verse 32, they said, We are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God had given to them that obey him. So they combine that. In the, chapter 10, for the sake of our time, in the house of Cornelius, here's, here's Peter again. He preached to him and told him in verse 39, we are witnesses of these things. In verse 40, Acts 10, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. And to him give all the prophets witness. Notice that salvation never came because of eyewitness. 
It came when they quoted the prophets. He said, look, and through his name, whosoever believes in him should receive remission of sins. Then they believe. Now, look at Paul, Acts 13. Acts 13. Again, from verse 17 to 23, Paul began to preach. He quoted the Old Testament. Then he got to verse 24 and says, When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Where did Paul get this from? He got it from those folks. John the Baptist. As John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I'm not he. John wrote no book. This was the eyewitness. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes, the shoes of his feet, I'm not worthy to lose. So, Paul recognized the importance of those who saw it and heard it. Yet, watch this now, in verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them that came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. Notice that those who are his witnesses doesn't include you and I. Who's following what we're saying here? Good. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise that was made unto the Father. Now, what is the gospel? The eyewitness or the prophecy? The eyewitness is a fulfillment of the prophecy. But it is critical to the gospel that we preach to show men that what had been prophesied had come to pass. Are you still there? Right. So Paul quoted that. So what they saw was scriptures fulfilled, not scriptures explained. Fulfilled. They were eyewitnesses. The book of Acts is the same. It's a book that wrote down experiences, not the explanation. The same thing. Experiences. Eyewitness. And oh, how we need the book of Acts. How we need the book of Acts. Same way we needed the four gospels. But we cannot live in the narrations. We have to explain it. So the book of Acts, just like the four Gospels, they require explanation. Who's following what we're saying here now? So just like the four Gospels are eyewitness of the work of Christ, his words, the things he de- said, They are not the explanation. Many times, they don't have the explanation in themselves. This is why till today, majority, not majority, I take that back, a whole lot of believers believe on the day of Pentecost, the whole world were speaking different languages. You know where they got it from? They didn't get it from any apostle, they got it from the crowd. We have built theologies over the years on what people around said. And we ignored what Peter said. Peter quoted Joel. And he says, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, not speak people's languages. We ignore Peter. But what those who say, are this not not drunk? Those are the things that we are building doctrine on. That on that day they spoke Egyptian. <laughs> and Chinese. Interesting. So, the book of Acts requires explanation. Very good. When you see Peter, Acts, the Ananias and Sapphira, that Satan filled their heart and then they died. And they say, are you Ananias in this place? Someone said, someone said, the reason why it happened was that the glory of God was too fresh. And God was going to protect his glory. So as they lied about their tithe, because the tithe belongs to God. If you don't give him, he will demand it. 
And if you don't give him after he has demanded, he will take it in one way or the other. When your tire just goes off on the road, he's taking it back. Your car is just not working because it is his own. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> so they said, the glory was so fresh. I said, and I asked the brother, I said, is it the glory that is fresh or Peter was the one that was fresh? Because we saw Peter again in Acts 8. He got to uh, Samaria. He laid hands on folks and he heard about one guy who was taking the shine before. Simon the sorcerer. Say, where is he? He's in my church now. Okay. Then Simon the sorcerer had the guts to come to the front. Minister seat. You no know, rich guys are proud. Say, so give me this power. He didn't say, so give me this power. So whomsoever. He had offered them money. Brother, his checkbook. What's the name of the ministry, sir? <laughs> Peter the Rock, Apostle's ministry. <laughs> you know what I'm doing, sir? I'm writing a check. Open check. Give me this power. And Peter said, your money perish with you. The message to Jesus says, to hell with your money. <laughs> he said, Perish. A believer, a new convert. Thou art taught that the gift of God will be purchased with money. You have no part, no lot in this matter. Peter was wrong. Obviously, because he wasn't the one that preached to the guy. <laughs> because when you are the one following someone you got saved up, you won't say those kind of things. Philip was the one that preached. Luke said that the man believed and followed Philip. Peter got there. So you have no part, no lot. And you are building a doctrine on that. It's not a book of a doctrine. It's just eyewitness. You are seeing the spiritual growth process of Peter. But you know, he's gotten better than Acts 5. At least the guy stayed alive after. <laughs> He didn't put fear to the guy's heart. There was fear, but the fear had reduced in temperature. The other one, they were so afraid. Well, and I said, he just went back. At attack. As the wife came and heard it three hours, and nobody in the church put it on Facebook, brother died in service. <laughs> Selfie. As she heard it three hours, she died. She said, Foot of yours, and it's your following. By Acts 10, he was calmer. By Acts 15, Peter now said, he was talking calmly. <laughs> because he was now more developed spiritually. That's the difference. But Luke dared not write it there. That's as Apostle Peter was going. <laughs> That would be cunningly devised, people. <laughs> he has to just write what he saw. It's you and I that will now explain it. Who's following what we're saying here? So the book of Acts is like that. Just like the four Gospels. They require explanation. Are you still there? So put it like this in Russian. So the epistles are the Spirit's witness. The Spirit's witness, the explanation, the Spirit witness, the book of Acts and the four Gospels is eyewitness of the Spirit's work. But the epistle is a Spirit's witness of his own work. The four Gospels. And the, piece, and, the, and the book of Acts are the eyewitness of the work of Christ. Eyewitness of the Spirit's work. But the epistle is the Spirit's witness of his work. You following this? In John 14, go back quickly. Man. 
Touch them up here. John 14. Jesus says in verse 20, At that day you shall know I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. John 14, 20. Could that happen by touching his body? No. No. The knowledge here is supernatural. Remember, Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. It did not change upon his resurrection. Flesh and blood still did not reveal who he was to them. He didn't. It's the Father. It's the Spirit. The work of the Spirit. So the epistles are the work of the Spirit. In verse 9, John 14, he says, you, He that has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? It means, now it mentions here, if you have, and you have not known me. Now, he uses a terminology I want you to take note of here in, in these two instances. It's the word ginosko. It means to learn and then later on, he uses the word to appreciate, to learn, to recognize. Similar to what you do in school. You come, to, you come into a knowledge. That is not experiential. It eventually will produce experiences. It's a knowledge, a recognition of a fact that you gradually come into. So, this cannot be done by eyewitness. Look at the word. You will know that I am in, verse 20, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. That is not done by eyewitness. That is a contact of revelation. In verse 16, he says, I will pray the Father. He will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Can we take verse 17 together? He will, everybody come and let's go. Whom the world cannot receive, because he sees him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be where? So the prepositions must be operative. Revelation is the key word here. Mark Hankin says it's like this. That the four Gospels are photographs. And I believe the book of Acts as well. The epistles are like an x-ray. A photograph can show you a guy and he's looking really handsome and looking cool. In fact, these days, you know, photographs can be deceptive. When they do proper padding, Makeup. Are you wonder? I, I, I'm. I'm always wondering. Nah, this is not. An, this is. Don't take me seriously. But, but when a lady does all the makeup for a wedding day, and she's all made up, and she's looking, oh God! <laughs> and the husband who saw her yesterday sees her now. Don't you think he can just walk away and say, "This is not you." Don't take me seriously. And he goes, wow. And then the very next day, you are back to yourself. <laughs> so just for a photograph. Some guys are looking so good. But then they go to the doctor. And then they do a checkup. You are not good, though. <laughs> because they look at the details. The infinite details. The exact details. So the four gospels is like a photograph. You can only see with the eyes. But to look in is an x-ray. And that's the spray's walk. We don't look in. So as he, as Jesus appeared that day and they saw him, their eyes couldn't go beyond that. But if by the Holy Ghost they looked at him well, Peter would have found himself in that person. James would have seen himself in him. John would have seen that the fellow talking to us, he's not alone. I am right there with him. But he couldn't have seen that 
Neither could they have written that. That is the work of the Spirit. Whenever you see Jesus today, whether you have a transport to heaven or you see him physically in the bus stop, if you look closely, you will see you are there with him. That is the Spirit's work. Flesh and blood cannot reveal that. That is the work of the Spirit. The reason why the book of Acts was the way it was. That's it. Listen. You know, we said they never mentioned Father. Was because all the sermons were evangelistic. They were not sermons for spiritual growth. For God so loved the world, evangelistic. But when you go into the epistles, what you find majorly will be a revelation of what Christ has accomplished. Not for now, but in the believer. The closest is Acts 20.32. And I'm going to run through that. Acts 20.32. And I've seen people mangle and mismangle that verse. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Now, any language student knows that the way it's in the King James is contradictory. I can't say be built up and you are given an inheritance. An inheritance does not require qualification. So, oftentimes, pay attention here, the verses here are so constructed that the syntax, the arrangement of words were wrong. When he says, an inheritance among all them which are sanctified, and he says the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you. The building up there and the giving are past tense events. You are founded by the word of grace. And you have been given an inheritance. And this inheritance belongs to all them that are sanctified. It's not a future walk. Hallelujah. I commend you unto what God has done for you in Christ. That's what he said. So, which is able, today, if I'm going to trust this, which was able, or which has, with the ability to build you up and give you an inheritance. Look at chapter 26. Paul repeats the same thing in verse 18. To open their eyes, chapter 26 verse 18, and to turn, watch this, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. What does he call it? Huh? Among them which are what? By faith. Has that happened? Has that happened? Now, Acts 20, 32 and Acts 26, 18, are they saying the same thing? Yes. He's built his church. He told them in Ephesus, the same church, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Ephesians 2, 18, 20, 20. Jesus Christ himself is a chief cornerstone. We have access to God. He said that earlier. So Acts 20, 32 is not a future tense. It's an evidence of the finished work of Christ. Can I have a name, man? Amen. So it's already ours. It's ours. It's just like James 1. I'm closing here. It's James 1 and 22 or 21. Laying aside all filthiness. And superfluity of naughtiness. Then he says, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save. No, 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 that's not possible. It's a past tense. Because the word engrafted refers to someone being born. The, the word of your birth, which is able, past tense, to save you. It has saved you. 
Because he had told you earlier in chapter 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of the first fruit of his creature. So if we are born of the word, we can't be saved by the word again. We are born of the word. That's why I call it implanted. A word of your birth. So the epistles show us this inheritance. They explain them to us. The epistles, therefore, will be the revelation. The revelation that explains the eyewitnesses. And as we look at it, we're going to make some discoveries. Are you ready? Some discoveries. In John 14, 16, I pray the Father, he will give you another comforter. The word there is alos paracletos, the same, one and the same comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Hallelujah. Who abides? The word abides there means to exist, is the word am I, to exist with you forever. Even the spirit of truth. We've always thought that what Jesus meant was this. The father will stay somewhere. Then he will give you like this. He will just, he, you are like this. He gives you another comforter. So when he likes, he can suspend it or take it. No. That he may abide. Because those verses are the way they were. You would think he's talking about somebody else. That he may abide. The he can be someone else. Because he was discussing the father. Are you still there? He says, with you. It shall be in you. He says, in that day you will know that I'm in my father. And I'm in you. And you are in me. The Father did not send His Spirit. The Father came by His Spirit. And He dwells in the man that has believed the gospel. He dwells in that man. The Father did not send someone to us. And then we'll see Him later. The Father came Himself. And He is in the believer today. We're not waiting to see the Father. We're growing to see the Father by revelation every day. To see his work. To see his deeds. To see him. To know him. As we open the epistles, we're not reading a story. We're reading a revelation. We're not reading a narration. We're reading an explanation. Of those words. Like the day done. To the day star. Rise in our hearts. And we blessed. And we blessed. We are a people of prophecy. We are a people of prophecy. We fulfill. The scriptures. By faith. We are believed in our hearts. The gospel. The father not a third party. The Father dwells in us today. You believe that? You believe that? You can't see that by experience. You see it by revelation. You see it by explanation. You walk in the light of it. Hallelujah. You're blessed this morning. Lift those hands. Let's just worship the Father. Come on. Sing in the Holy Ghost wherever you are. Give Him praise. Sing in the Holy Ghost. Just bless his name. Give him praise. Thank you. Thank you. Zahadosa Fahanda Kizo Fraka the Bas Saranitis. Raka Dosa Rakana Nazo Susa Fahalatis. Zebro Koda Pada Pada Panda Skoda Bala Dada 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 Give him praise. Come and lift those hands and bless his name. Lift those hands, come on and bless his name. Lift those hands and bless his name.